This is a passage that a lot of people like to avoid because it's about divorce. And uh, divorce has touched us all in one form or another. We all have friends, family, relatives, or maybe even ourselves who, who have gone through a divorce. And what Jesus says about it is, is quite striking. And so we are going to read that. But uh, we're going we're gonna to prepare to have our hearts a little tenderized here. But let's first say a short prayer. Uh, Lord God, uh, your word is, is sometimes challenging and sometimes difficult to, to hear, difficult to understand. But we pray that you would speak to us today. And that, Lord, we would be edified and built up by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 19, 1 through 12. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to them, him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For some are eunuchs, who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. And that's where we'll stop. Okay. One thing that I've noticed over the years is that when it comes to our romantic partners or prospective romantic partners, um, people get really touchy about that. You uh, find somebody who uh, is just starting to go out with somebody else and you suggest to them, hey, maybe this person isn't really that good for you. They, they don't usually take that very well. They, they usually get really defensive and angry because this is their romantic partner. And this person just means a great deal to them and makes them feel good about themselves and all that. They got these, these uh, wonderful puppy love romantic feelings going on. And so people don't usually take that very well and, and you and I are, are human beings too. So I think it, it's first important to, to point out this. Jesus is better than any person and offers love that's perfect. We need to remember who Jesus is first in our, in our lives. And he is better than any person that is out there on this planet who has ever lived. And his love that he offers us is far superior and perfect in every respect, more than anyone in this world could possibly give us. In fact, I'm a very strong believer that when you and I close our eyes for the last time and we open them and we see the face of Jesus, we are going to experience perfect love and we are going to be so overwhelmed with joy and delight and happiness that we are going to say, I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. Nothing beats this. Let me never, I never want to be away from, from this person who loves me so much. So let's, let's have that in mind. Jesus is superior to any person, any romantic partner that is out there. And he loves us enough to tell us what we don't want to hear, but we need to hear. And that is 
may be the case here, but the whole Bible. We should be opening the Bible and we should be offended. We should be challenged. We should be uh, wounded, if you will, because you and I, we're, we're sinful human beings and we constantly need to be shaped and molded by who Jesus is. And so this, this passage should not be an exception. This should be the rule, in fact. So, even if Jesus says what we don't like, or the Bible says what we don't like, we need to, we need to hear it out, and we need, to, we need to receive it. And if we don't like it, let's recognize that we don't like it. Okay, a couple things about divorce in Jesus' time. Okay? In Jesus' day, first one, marriage was not the way marriage is today. Marriage was for a diff- very different purpose. Marriage was for securing the future and less romantic attachment. You got married um, within your clan to ensure that your inheritance would stay within people that you could trust. And your parents would arrange your marriages. So, and this would happen from when you were usually a young person. And so both sets of parents would come together and say, how about my son marry your daughter? Sounds good. Here's the contract and all of that. They would arrange all of that. Marriages were civil contracts to share resources and produce the next generation. That's what marriages was about. We have two families that have different resources, and now you bring these families together. Now they can share those resources, and now we know that the, the next generation from this marriage is going to be raised in, in a good way. And the, the family... Property and inheritance is going to stay with the family. So that's, that's what marriage was about. It's not like today where, you know, you find somebody who's, who's cute, you get to know them, and they're, they're very delightful to be around, and you, wanna, you, you didn't get to pick your marriage partner. Marriage was very practical. Another thing, number two here, divorce could be done for any reason. So it's not unlike today, where we have no-fault divorce. You don't need a reason for divorce. You can just go and, and have a divorce. And that was the case back then. In Jewish society, divorce could be, had to be, well, it had to be done by the husband. Only a man could divorce his wife. Sometimes the man would be pressured to divorce his wife if things weren't going well from society or, or family or other things like that. And to do it, a husband simply had to basically just take a piece of paper and uh, write... Uh, you are not my wife, or something to that effect, and give it to her. And then she would not be his wife anymore. And whenever anybody would accuse her of you know, being unfaithful because she doesn't live with her husband anymore, she could pull this out and say, look. So that's basically how divorces, how divorces went. It was really simple to do. Um, and a wife would then return to her father's house or her brother's house and her dowry, which was usually quite significant, the money that, uh, that goes to the couple when, when they get married. The dowry would go with her. The children would stay with him. So that's a little bit different than today, too. And remarriage was the norm. You... Uh, you married for survival and for resources and for security and not romantic attachment or, or sexual desires or anything like that. You married for security and so remarriage was the norm because of that. Divorce was common. It was undesirable, but it was not shameful. It was not considered it was not something that people looked down on you upon. It was in an unfortunate situation, maybe like, I don't know, maybe like car accidents or something like that. You, you know, it's, it's really annoying, it's unfortunate, but it's not necessarily like, like uh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself necessarily. Um, in Jesus' day, this is not on the screen here, but I want to mention this. In Jesus' day, there, were, there was a big debate about what was a lawful divorce based on the Old Testament. So there were two schools of thought. One of them said, you can only divorce your wife if uh, you find uh, that uh, she was not faithful to you before you were married. 
that would be the only legitimate grounds for divorce or, or not faithful to you during the marriage. Other than that, you can't divorce. The other school of thought was the one that ended up prevailing and that you can divorce your wife for any reason at all. She makes you toast and she burns it, you can divorce her. Any reason at all. And in fact, one interpreter actually says, even if he found another fairer than she, you can divorce for those reasons even. And so that was behind this question. The Pharisees come up to him, so Jesus, you know there's this big debate going on about you know, what's a lawful divorce and not, so you, you tell me. Is it lawful to divorce your wife for any and every reason, like the majority of people think? What do you think? And they were looking to trap him, obviously, because obviously it says this was a test. Um, they wanted to see if he was going to go against the law of Moses or to get him to say something that people would not like. So verse 4, Jesus' response. Let's look at this here. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Okay. What this we can tell, marriage is part of the original created order. All right. The whole, the whole Bible has creation and then it has fall into sin. Then it has redemption from your sin. And then in the end, we look forward to one day when all things will be made new, a restoration of sorts. Or consummation sometimes. So marriage is part of this beginning created order. We don't get married because sin came into the world. We get married because God designed us this way to, to be married, to have progeny and have, have uh, next generation and stuff like that. This is part of God's design. And so Jesus goes back to that. One thing uh, I think is fascinating is he's quoting scripture to people who know scripture backwards and forwards. And I love how he even says, have you not read? He's almost saying, guys, what's the matter with you? You know this. Let me repeat it for you. Because obviously, you've forgotten. He's, he's kind of putting them in their place a little bit there. But marriage is part of the created order. It's part of God's design for humanity. Death is not part of our design. Work is part of our design because Adam was made to work the garden. Marriage and children are part of the design. And then verse 5 is interesting. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, which means that your, your marriage is a more important commitment than even to your parents. Um, and the two will become one flesh so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So this is interesting. Um, marriage is an act of God. You know, we, we do stuff. We, we, you know, we have our marriage ceremonies and, you know, do you? Yes, I do. Do you? Yes, I do. And, you know, we say vows and... And then we have a party and all of this kind of stuff. But really, when, when people are brought together in marriage, this is really God acting. It's, it's not unlike, you know, the sacraments. Where we apply water or eat and drink, but God is actually doing something there. So this is, this is fascinating. There's, there is spiritual relevance beyond what we notice in not only sacraments, but also in marriage. Marriage is an act of God, and that is true whether you get married in a church or a courthouse or you're part of a tribe in the Amazon and you have the, your own ceremony or whatever. If, if that couple from the tribe in the Amazon moved to the United States, we would recognize them as married because they've made the commitment before their people. That's what marriage is. And we would recognize that as not just two people committing to each other, but God joining them together. This is, this is fascinating. So part, it's part of the creation, and this is a fusion of two people of God 
What, and then Jesus ends it right there, you notice. He, he puts a period after that, and then he doesn't talk anymore. What he's basically saying, what therefore God has joined together, let nobody separate. He's basically saying there are no grounds for divorce at all. None. Let nobody separate. So, what I, what I noticed this week when I was studying this passage is that this passage is very similar to the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. But one thing that the Sermon on the Mount does is it, Jesus says, okay, you've heard it was said this, or this is what it says in the law, but here's what I'm telling you. The bar is this high, not down here like you think it is. It's really up here. So this is kind of what he's doing. He's actually saying the bar is a lot higher than what you thought. And, I, and it's fascinating. He ends it right there. So then the Pharisees there are like, well, in verse 7, why did Moses command otherwise? So basically they're saying, what about Deuteronomy 24 verse 1? They're, again, these people know the Bible pretty well. And that's why it's funny when Jesus says, hey, haven't you read this? So here, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 is all together, but this is just verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and then whatever indecency is, that was what the big debate was at the time. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hands and sends her out of his house. So Moses kind of assumes, or the law here, assumes that this happens. So the Pharisees are like, what about this verse? Moses commanded this. And so that's a, that's a le legitimate question, I think. And so Jesus' response, verse 8. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So he's saying divorce is part of the fall. This is not God's design. God didn't design us to get divorced. He designed us to marry. God didn't design us to die. Dying is part of the fall. Divorce is part of the fall. So this is a new reality that we got to deal with, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. This is not the way God designed it. This is not the way God wants it. It's part of the fall. Moses permitted divorce to keep bad situations from being worse. Divorce is a result of sin because of your hardness of heart, as he puts it. It's not God's design. And so Moses had laws about what to do when somebody was harmed or murdered. That doesn't mean murder is okay. He's saying because of the fall, we have new situations we got to deal with. And so if somebody is murdered or attacked or assaulted or something like that, here's how you deal with it. That doesn't mean that these are good things. And so that's what Jesus is basically saying. Now, you all know that the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the books that talk about Jesus and what he said and did and taught. Okay? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in a lot of ways. And we read out of Matthew, Mark and Luke have similar passages. And what's noteworthy is that Mark and Luke lack Matthew's except for clause. That part where it says except for sexual immorality, that's not in Luke or in Mark. If you read Luke and Mark, that does not appear. So I got them up here. So, Mark, so Matthew 19.9 19, 19, 9 is at the top. You see the except for sexual immorality, that's in bold there. In Mark, it just says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Luke, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. There's no except for clause in Mark or Luke. I think that's interesting. Now, Matthew is still part of God's word, and we still listen to it, but it's interesting what Mark and Luke remember versus what Matthew remembers. 
And I think that there is some significance to this, but I think what, is, what we need to notice from verse 9 here is that it's not divorce that's, that's, uh, that is what he's saying is adultery, but divorce and remarriage is what he's calling adultery. And you can see that in just how it's worded there, particularly Mark and, and Luke. That's what he's saying. Because it goes against the design. God designed us to be faithful to one person for our whole life. That's the design. And when you break that design, then that falls into the next category of fall or into sin. That's not the way God intended it. So every divorce is a broken vow. You say, till death do us part. And a divorce is a broken vow. Now, there are some strict segments of Christianity um, and some people that I've known before who would say, if you are divorced and remarried, you have to actually go back to your first husband or wife and try to make it work. That they would actually tell you to, to leave who you were currently married to. I, I don't agree with that at all. Um, but, but they look at this and that's where, what, how they come to that conclusion. Because this, this is a pretty eye-opening statement. But if that is actually what Jesus has wanted us to do, then Jesus would have to be telling people left and right, you need to go back to your first spouse. Because again, not unlike today, back then divorce was very common. There were lots of people who had divorced and remarried. This was common. This was regular. And so if that was the case, if that was what we were supposed to do, then Jesus would have been telling people to do it left and right. And we have no record of him ever doing that. So I don't think that's the idea here. Verse 10, the disciples said to him, such is the case of a man with his wife. It's better not to marry. <laughs> I like that. They, they, so they basically see what Jesus did here, and they're like, oh, he's saying the bar's up here. And they're like, yeah, I'm not, not I'd better to be not married then. If there's no escape from it, then uh, I'm, I'm out. They recognized. They thought the bar's too high. You're setting the bar too high here. You might as well just not get married at all. Um, that, that's, this is unreasonable, Jesus. You can't, you can't expect this. And if, and if this is the way it is, then just, I'm never getting married. Well, and Jesus' response is, well, no, 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 you didn't misunderstand. You, you misunderstood me. He didn't say that. He basically says, well, God does not call everybody to get married. There are some people who God calls to serve his kingdom full time without any constraints. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Jesus was an example of that. The Apostle Paul was an example of that. Not everybody is called to marriage. That's okay. <laughs> Unmarried and celibate was very, very rare in Jewish society. You were, you have, getting married and having kids was part of your religious duty. So... Jesus was very odd, and the Apostle Paul would have been very odd for their times. But Jesus says in verse 12, some are called to be single to devote themselves to the kingdom. Some, God calls some people to do that. Not everybody, but some. And in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul reiterates that same point. Okay, so some takeaways for us. This is, this is the passage. Let's put it together. I think the most important thing here that we're supposed to take away is that marriage is a sacred union and must be held in high honor. That's, I think, the first thing we're supposed to take away from this. Marriage is not just a business contract where if you're, if you're partnering with somebody on a business and uh, the relationship goes sour and you go your separate ways, no big deal. You know, not ideal, but, uh, but you know, nothing... Nothing tragic or anything, but marriage is a sacred union that is done by God. 
and it should be held in the highest honor possible to the point where Jesus says, what God joins together, let nobody pull apart. Nobody. And you can see it in other passages of Scripture too. Ephesians 5, 29 through 32. And then Hebrews 13, 4. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And then he quotes the same verse that Jesus quoted, and then says, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Every marriage is a depiction of God's love for his people. Christ's love for the church. And every time that image is broken, that's, that's tragic. Or Hebrews 13, 4, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Okay, high value of marriage. High value. As in many other instances, Jesus particularly like in the Sermon on the Mount, like I mentioned before, Jesus is putting the moral bar higher than we might think is reasonable. Okay? Jesus does this a lot. You've heard that it was said you shouldn't murder. And I'm telling you that if you're just even angry with somebody, then that's murder. You heard that you, it was, you should not commit adultery. I'm telling you that if you're, if you're lustfully looking at somebody, that's adultery. Okay? You've heard it was said, here, I'm telling you this. All right? Let's look at some of these from the Sermon on the Mount here. So, there's, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. You heard that it was said, but I say to you. Okay, those are the two examples I just mentioned. Go to the next ones here. It was also said, who divorces his wife, but I say to you. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. And there's more. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I'm saying to you, or now, in this passage, have you not read? This is what it says. And I'm saying to you this. So the pattern of language in his teaching is very similar Jesus has a way of saying, okay, the law technically says this, but what's behind it is this, and that's the standard that is really going on here. So, so divorce kind of falls into the same category as those other things in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is kind of putting the bar higher than what we would think is reasonable. So don't even be angry with someone. Don't even look at somebody lustfully. Don't retaliate. And don't ever get a divorce. Never. Far higher. I think what we can conclude from this passage is maybe something like this. Divorce is sometimes necessary but it's never what you would call justified. And it's always tragic and a last resort that breaks God's sacred union. You might compare it to, to killing a person. It's never a good thing. It's never something that you would ever delight in or that ever would be a good thing. But there are times when it might be necessary. Very rarely, there's a lot more people who, who are murdered than, than what there should be, obviously. There's a lot more divorces out there than what there should be, but there are times when killing somebody might be necessary. But justified, I'm not sure. It might be compared to that. It's always, it's, always, um, it's always a tragedy. Every divorce tears apart what God has made to join together. And that's sad. It's tragic. Every time somebody is killed, 
something is lost that God made to be together. And it's tragic. Let's keep that in perspective. I think that if there's somebody that you know who is going through a divorce, this, this needs to be almost a time of, it's almost like somebody died. Like a good response would be like, I'm so sorry. You know? Because even in the, the cases where divorce would be a relief because it's, it's a terrible marriage, it's still a tragedy. Even when somebody dies and it's a relief because there was so much misery there, it's still a tragedy that somebody died. Okay? What Jesus seems to be doing here is not so much setting rules for what counts as a valid divorce or doesn't. That doesn't seem to be what he's doing here. What he's doing here is he's stressing the permanence and sacredness of marriage and he's just putting it as high as he can. That words will allow. And what seems to be the case, Mark and Luke don't have that exception clause. If Jesus' goal here was to set some exceptions or what counts as a justified divorce, then two out of the three witnesses to what Jesus said missed the boat. I don't think Jesus here is just is trying to make a legal framework for what counts as a godly divorce and what doesn't so that we can blame people for an ungodly divorce and respect people who have a valid divorce. That's not what he's doing here. And if it was, then Mark and Luke dropped the ball. I don't think that's what's happening. What he's basically saying is this. You people divorce like it's nothing. That's not what marriage is. Marriage should never be broken, ever. That's basically what he's saying. And if you're a Christian, this is not on the screen, although I kind of wish it was. If you're a Christian, your, your life is not yours, it's God's. In fact, everything of your life is not yours, it's God's. You belong to Jesus Christ. Your marriage belongs to Jesus Christ. You better work on your marriage. Nurture it. Do what it takes to make it work. Do what it takes to make it blossom and grow and be healthy every, in every way. This is God's marriage. Are you going to just let it die? Or let it languish? Don't do that. This is God's marriage. Make it prosper and grow in every way. As much as you can. Christ followers do everything possible to make marriages work. And not just our own, but even others too. If any of you who are married here are going through a rough spot in your marriage and you need some, some counseling or help or something like that, church will help you pay for that. Because your marriage is what we want it to succeed. And if there's trouble, we'll help you with that. Christians do everything in their power to make marriages work. One final verse. If any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever... And she consents to live with him. He should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. You should stay together even if the other person is not a believer. We do everything possible to make a marriage work, even if it's between a believer and an unbeliever. Let's look at the screen here. What is God's will for you in the 10th commandment? That not even the slightest thought or desire contrary to any one of God's commandments should ever arise in my heart. Rather, with all my heart, I should always hate sin and take pleasure in whatever is right. The bar is this high. And it is virtually unattainable. But this is where we aim for. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. And that's what this passage is about. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you have uh, you've sent your Son and He set the bar really high, uh, higher than, than we could ever attain. Every one of us has been angry, every one of us has been lustful, every one of us has retaliated, and some of us have gone through divorces. And so, Lord, 
we pray that we would aim high for all that you have commanded us and designed us for. And that, Lord, we would do whatever we can to make our marriages work and others' marriages work and prosper also. Uh, Lord, teach us to hold marriage in the highest regard for your sake, not, not even ours, but for yours. In the name of Jesus, amen.